Josh Allard had a lot to say on a recent appearance of three guys before the game. Talked about the roster. Talked about what he's been doing this offseason and the, the roster turnover that's occurred for West Virginia. Mountaineer Paul and I are going to react to all that right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of Hoops and Hills is brought to you by Dutch Miller Automotive, where friends and family pricing, pricing means you get the best deal right up front on any new or pre-loved vehicle in stock every time. With brands like Chevrolet, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Kia, Hyundai, Ford, GMC, Buick, and Subaru, the Dutch Miller Automotive family is always growing and ready to put you in the car or truck you've been searching for. Check out our inventory across West Virginia at DutchMillerAuto.com or come in today to the home of friends and family pricing, only at a Dutch Miller Automotive store near you. What is up, College Hoops fans, Mountaineer fans? My name is Coos. And my name is Mountaineer Paul. And we present to you another episode of Hoops from the Hills, baby. We are back. I know it's been a while, guys. It's the off season in basketball. There's not been a whole lot to talk about. So, but but today, Mountaineer Paul and I have some some things we wanted to share with you. Uh, just kind of kind of a reaction. Just a it's going to be a, just a general conversation that Paul and I are going to have here regarding Josh Allard's recent appearance on the Three Guys Before the Game podcast with Tony Caridi, Brad Howe, and Hoppy Kerchival. He talked about a lot of things. He he broke down the roster. Talked about you know some of his off season trips overseas. Uh, talked about, you know, obviously the opportunity to be the head coach at West Virginia, what it means to him, things like that. So, Paul, first things first, man, let's just start off with this. What is your general takeaway from that conversation with Josh Allard? Well, I mean, I think it's no surprise that I'm extremely impressed with the man and really impressed with his overall intellect as far as how he – carries himself in a conversation, in a general conversation. But what I was more surprised with was how open he was, transparent. Uh, and, and maybe as he grows and as a coach, maybe he'll grow, you know, fall back into that coach speak. Because I think a lot of what I can find out is when you're open about things, people will attack those things that you talk about. And I hope that doesn't happen to him here. But I hope he stays this way. Uh, Cause I love it when we have not only is it good for content creators like us, but it's also just great as a fan to see a coach is mm -hmm. open and transparent because that way we know what the heck's going on. There's no secrets between us. Don't tell us something's blue when it's green. Don't act like you have a good team coming back this year. If you don't, if you're worried, tell us, I, I really think in my opinion, it, it really, as far as the public goes can help a coach when they're transparent about situations like that. And Josh seems bullish on this team. Uh, got a lot of great pieces, and I think he was, uh, you know, pretty honest about the depth of this team and how it's mm -hmm. really going to have to come along, and there are concerns mm -hmm. there with the depth. But right. there is no shortness of excitement. I think a lot of us are excited. He's excited. I think a lot of us think this team can make a run. Yeah, and uh, you talked two things I want to – you said two things there I want to touch on. The first off about the openness and, and transparency, and then the second – about the depth and what some of the weaknesses may be and how they're going to approach this season from a play style and that, that kind of thing. First, let's touch on the transparency. He said a couple things that a coach uh -huh. normally don't say. Uh, did you hear the comment? They asked uh, – Tony Caridi compared Jose Perez to Teddy Allen, which that's, I'm going to be yeah. honest with you. You and I have done the made the exact same comparison, have we not? Yes, we on have. On the show right here. So it made me feel good that, hey, this – this so he'll be these he's hillbillies from the sticks know what we're talking about, but nonetheless, Just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Josh is then what he said about Teddy Buckets afterwards. <laughs> yeah, he said uh, basically he's got his head head on his head screwed on better, than, and I'm paraphrasing, but he's he has his head screwed on better than Teddy does. Basically, is what he said talking about Jose. Yeah, yeah, but he yeah, went on. No, to talk, I think and, <clears throat> he probably shouldn't have said that, but but. But moving forward, he he talked about how Jose's been such a huge piece to the recruiting this offseason and getting other guys on the team. Right. So cook, what do cook. you have to – yeah, a big one. So what do you have to well, say we, about that comment and, and about Jose overall? Well, you know, I think we – the reason Teddy didn't work at Morgantown was he was still in the chair and he had yeah. to transfer a bunch of times. And this is 
a common thing we see. Jose is similar in the fact that he's basically, if I had to guess, I would say that he and Teddy were probably more alike than similar at the beginning of their journeys. And remember, we're at the very end of Jose's mm -hmm. journey. So I'd say there are probably some past coaches and teammates that might have mm -hmm. a couple things to say about his maturity. Similar True. with Teddy, we were at the beginning of his journey. By the True. time he ended that thing, he was the best player on his team and a great scorer. So I think, you know, what Teddy ended up being probably wasn't what he began as and similar for right. Jose right. to point. here. So I think that's why Jose is going to be looked upon as a leader for this team. I'm excited to see that. I think a lot of people were, were fed up over the summer with his uh, social media antics. But, guys, never forget with Jose Perez that he was a victim more than anything. Remember, he had several coaches either be fired or quit on him. Uh, and, and every stop he was at, name them, he, his coach was either fired or, got, or quit. Something happened. Yes, he was a little bit too vocal on social media. But, I mean, he, you know, this is, these are kids that are constantly in the spotlight, and I'm sure that they crave that when they're not getting it or miss it. So I think mm -hmm. that had a lot to do with that. But uh, excited about Jose and what he can do for us this year. I think he's going to be a leader. As far as his recruitment goes or his recruiting other players goes, it's no secret. Uh, it was leaked out, I think, is the best way to put it, because I don't think we were supposed to know as a fan base. It was on message boards a month before it happened, a, for, a former top 30 five-star player is linked with Jose Perez. That's what we kept hearing. Mm -hmm. And and they added the caveat that he played in Morgantown before. So that really narrowed it down. And a lot of us looked and said, well, that's got to be a freaking a cook, a cook before it ever happened. And, of course, mm -hmm. we were right. And that's why a lot of Georgetown folks thought we tampered, you know, and we didn't. They did yeah. it by the book. Uh, players communicating with other players is legal. Excuse me, is legal, and that's what they did. They just used Jose. He wanted to do it, and and we have a cook of cook who seems to be really excited about as far as Josh Allen goes. He says that he suspects he was going to be named preseason defensive player of the year before he transferred. So take that with what you will. Because I'm excited about him as a defensive option for the Mountaineers. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and that segues into the second part of what I want to talk to you about. And that's uh, and, and, it, and it still goes along with the transparency piece. And that's what Josh had to say about some of the some of the concerns. And then also he he almost lit up like a Christmas tree when they talked about wanting to play fast on offense. Yeah. This team is yeah. man, I, I'm so excited to watch his offense. They're going to run up and down the court, man. We're we're probably going to see a lot of fast breaks. We're going to see a lot of. I mean, it kind of takes me back. Maybe maybe it'll be a little bit like Mike D'Antoni style ball. I hope that's really exciting yeah. to watch, right? With now some to defense, do that, you, now to, right? <laughs> well, and that and that segues into the next part. One of the concerns I took away from this, kind of reading between the lines, and I don't even know if it's reading between the lines. I think he kind of said it. He's a little concerned about how well they'll guard on the perimeter at the guard positions. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, look at there? who they – sorry. Look at who they went and got. They got two of the best rim protectors in the country, right? Mm -hmm. And and so you make up your with your deficiencies with strengths. Now, we do have guys that are pretty good on ball defenders on this team. I think that he thinks Raekwon Battle could be a good on ball defender. Obviously, Kobe Johnson is a guy. We lost Joe Toussaint, who would have been the best returning defender on the team, not named Jesse Edwards or Cook the Cook, but that was – before they came. So coming back, though, as a returning player, you could probably make a really strong case that Joey T was going to be the best defender on the team. He's gone. There goes a perimeter defender. Obviously, you lose Keedy to, I guess, the NBA or the G League or wherever he's at overseas playing for the uh, the best Virginia team. Uh, so did he play for best Virginia? Yes. Yeah, I thought he did. Uh, so, yeah, but you lose those guys. So, obviously, it's got to come from somewhere. You can't say Suminick's going to do it. So, you go out and get a guy like a Cook a Cook who, what really shook me was when he said, can guard one through five. Yes. That's what he said. He's, he's <laughs> and, almost seven foot tall. And they were shocked to hear. Guard, <laughs> he's almost seven foot tall and can guard a point guard if he needs to. That's, that's impressive. Yeah, I agree. So, I do think there are some concern, obviously, uh, with the defense on this team. And I think they just kind of put their chips where they may and decided, you know what, 
We're already halfway there. We might as well become a good offensive team this year. And and then uh, and then since our perimeter defense in the front court or in the back court is so possibly weak, we'll strengthen the front court, add two guys that are written there that are basically erasers, you know, and mm-hmm. that's what they did. Yeah. I like it. I mean, is it ideal? No. I mean you obviously you want strong defenders across the board, but every team's gonna have weaknesses. The key is as coaches to to I guess you could use the word scheme or strategize around those weaknesses, right? And one way they do that, you bring in two rim protectors like a cook and like Edwards. Now, one of the concerns he mentioned about Edwards, and by the way, guys, we'll link to that interview in the description box. I encourage you guys, after you watch the show, go back and listen to this interview. It's very, very entertaining, uh, very enjoyable for, for Mountaineer fans to listen to. It just makes you fall in love with Josh Allard even more. But one of the things he's concerned about with Jesse Edwards is can he stay out of foul trouble? Uh, and this is something I had not thought about, Paul, and it was very eye-opening to me. But he talked about how, you know, at Syracuse, all he played was zone. They didn't play yeah. man a lot at Syracuse. Right. West Virginia is going to play man most of the time. And Jesse Edwards has never had to play a lot of pick-and-roll ball. And yeah, he's going to have to learn how to play pick-and-roll without fouling. And he's been right. he's struggling to do that a little bit at practice. Now, they've only, they've only had – I think he said they've been on a court – maybe 10 hours total so far is all they've been able to do uh, this summer. Uh, but he's trying to get that out of Jesse. Jesse Edwards has to learn to play defense without fouling in a man-to-man system. Yeah. And yeah. that's something that I'm a little concerned about and Josh has, has, is openly concerned about. So, uh, But if if Edwards gets in foul trouble, they can put a cook in at the five if they need to. And then they can put Quinn Slazinski at the four, who's a stretch four. And hopefully that solves that problem. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, and I, that's the solution to it. Now, is it the solution we want? No. Everybody knows we're thin in the front court. You know, it's basically a three-man race there, right? I mean, we lost who we lost, but you've got a cook, a cook. You've got Jesse Edwards, and you've got Quinn Slazinski. I think some people might argue that Slazinski should start so that a cook, a cook can be the guy to replace. But I'm of the mind that I think both of them can play together, get your best five on the floor, you know, and I think those two playing together back there, will really make up for a lot of deficiencies. But uh, as far as Jesse Edwards goes, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, Jim Beheim is known. His, like, if you go down a list of five things about Jim Beheim, probably before you get to three or four is going to be the zone that he's known for, the 2-3 zone that mm-hmm. they run there in Syracuse. And it's, you know, it's a staple of what they do defensively. And it's really one of the reasons why they're a top 50 defense every single year at Syracuse, no matter what is because they run that same thing over and over, and they just get good at one thing. It's kind of what we wish Neil Brown would do. So, shots fired. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I can understand why it's a big transition for him, too. Because, look, what a, what, a, what a zone would do for a player like Jesse Edwards, it actually plays to his strengths. At the end of the day, you've got a section of the court you guard, and, oh, by the way, you protect the rim. That's what he did. So you move him out on ball screens, out on the perimeter, that's probably something I don't know in Europe what they've done with him in the Netherlands and how they played. Hopefully they played some man-to-man there. But I, I would, you know, listen, it's basketball. I'm sure he's played man-to-man at certain points in his life. But uh, there is going to be a small learning curve with it, but it's not something he can overcome. It's not a, the end of the world or something that's some huge. It's not like playing offensive line where you've got all these different techniques you have to learn. It's literally just be less physical, you know, yeah. and unfortunately Jesse's just going to have to learn to play with his length and to his strengths and, and it changes the timing on block shots because you're running with the player instead of challenging a player at the rim. So I think he'll get it all worked out. And the cook of cook can probably teach him a lot with that. Right. And Josh made a comment too, about how he's looking to implement a, you know, a second or even third defense. Uh, that is a zone s- style, and it made me wonder: sure. will he, will he, will he go to a two-three zone in order to utilize Jesse Edwards' strength and experience? You know, who, who knows? I mean, it's not a bad idea. He's the best player in this team, and, and let's not forget that. Now, Raekwon Battle may have something to say about that, but as far as the con- who's most accomplished and the best player in this team is, you know, is Jesse Edwards a force on the offensive end that you can just throw the ball too close and let him score? Not necessarily. He scores it in other ways. 
said that over and over on this channel. Um, but overall, he's probably a guy that could be selected in the first round of next year's draft. And I think you have to play to your best player's strengths. Maybe it ends up being Raekwon Battle. I don't know. But for now, you know, we don't really know what's going on with that situation. I'm sure we're going to segue into that next as well. Um, but, yeah, I, I do think that, that the zone could be a great idea, something to employ, something to throw at teams. And it's certainly something Bob Huggins hasn't done in a long time since they ran the 1-3-1 one, one they were so successful with back in maybe 2010, 2011. Yeah. Um, speaking of battle, and that you know, thanks for that segue there. Battle, they talked about battles waiver. And we all know all West, West Virginia fans are waiting patiently to see what happens, or impatiently maybe would be a better word, to see what happens with Raekwon Battles' waiver. Because we all know Jesse Edwards' waiver was denied last year. We saw Omar Silverio's waiver get denied this year. Yeah. And the NCAA They're not even trying fair cons. <laughs> yeah, the NCAA has only is only has only approved nineteen percent of the multiple multiple transfer waivers that are out there, right? So there's a yeah. lot of concern that it won't get approved. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit as to why uh, as much as we can talk about anyway, yeah, as to why the Requiem Battles waiver, at least why Allard and the staff are confident his waiver will get approved? Well, he just has a different background than, I mean, I think Kansas had a player by the name of Lightfoot years ago that may have been a guy that either came from an Indian reservation or had ties, but to, to uh, the Indians. Um, Raekwon Battle has lived on an Indian reservation on and off, I think, most of his life. And um, what's crazy is, Josh Eilert can relate to that, right? And having also lived on a reservation, he, he knows what Raekwon Battle is going through. And it makes me wonder if he's, that is part of the reason that we were able to get him because he can relate to that. But from the NCAA standpoint, the situation surrounding, the situation surrounding Raekwon Battle, the details have been extremely scarce. We know it's a personal issue. And we know it has something to do with Raekwon's background. Kind of put two and two together here. How many kids from Indian reservations are trying to transfer in today's day and age? I would say it's probably less than 1%. So I think that's part of the reason they're so bullish on his transfer and waiver being approved. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are probably other aspects that are extremely personal that we don't know about that are also in their favor, they feel like. Yeah. And uh, I'm not, you know, we, I'm not going to get into all the details about the waiver and or, or the background and the Indian reservation stuff. You guys go listen to uh, the the podcast, and you'll know what we're talking about. But because they, Josh went into some detail about Indian reservations and how he relates to that and, and all that. And I don't want to give all that away. I don't think it'd be fair to their show. So go check it out when we're done here. But uh, it's very interesting, and I think it, if you read between the lines of what we already know, plus what Josh said in that podcast you will kind of have an idea as to why they, they feel good about it. You know, yeah. um, we were talking about the bigs earlier and, you know, we talked about, we've talked about Jesse Edwards, a cook, a cook, Quinn Slazinski. In that conversation, they mentioned Pat Sumnick and uh -huh. Alert kind of talked about how Sumnick is, he's able to play the four or the five. He said, you know, he preferred him to play the four, but because of their lack of depth, he may need him to play the five some. But he's, you know, he was pretty open and honest that he needs Pat Sumnick to step up and shoot the ball better, number one, and and step his game up a little bit if he wants to if he wants to play, uh, and he's got a great opportunity because he can play multiple positions to play. Yep. But it's it's kind of all up to him now as to how much better he gets. Uh, I know you've been really high on Pat Sumnick, Paul, um, over the yeah. last year or so. So what are your thoughts right. about about the Pat Sumnick conversation? Well, you know, go look up Pat Sumnick's junior college tape and tell me you're not impressed. You know, I, maybe I overestimated the transition to the Big 12 for him. Uh, I still feel like he can be a good contributing player. I, I never felt like he was going to be a star or anything like that, but I also I always felt like he would be a guy that could come in and give you six or eight points a game and, and can play tough defense. I mean, he's the strongest player on the team, they say, uh, according to what I've heard. So, I don't think that plays a factor. And on on film, at the junior college level, and I understand that's a different level, he really shows the ability to stroke it. 
and, and really, really made threes at a pretty high clip there. Um, I, I understand the length and athleticism is a lot different in the Big 12. And maybe that has a, you know, sometimes guys just don't translate. But I feel like Pat Subinick, if he works to it, based on what's on film out there, whenever he was so much better than everybody else, uh, can do that. And I think he's a guy that can be sneakily this year, uh, possibly be right there with Slazinski in line with that third slot in the, you know, in the front in the um, front court. So I'll be interested to see if that happens, and I'll be rooting for Patty Sue because, first of all, I love calling him Patty Sue. I think that's a cool name. Uh, and second of all, you know, I've been pretty open about how I feel about him possibly contributing, uh, even though he didn't do any of that last year. Yeah. And speaking of Pat Sonic, let's talk about – he mentioned – he basically – you know, they asked it. They went through the whole roster. But let's touch on the guys who are returning. You know, Seth Wilson, Kobe Johnson, Josiah Harris, the other three guys who were returning from last year's team. You know, all those guys have an opportunity to step up and have a role on this team, right? Yeah. Um, Seth Wilson is going to be looked at to be, you know, their guy who, when they need outside shots, he's going to be the guy they lean to to get them for the most part. You know, Kobe Johnson, he talked about – what I what I was uh, impressed with about Kobe is how he talked about Kobe's ability to defend and how if he can yeah. start making shots on a more consistent basis, he you know, he he could really make a big impact on the team. Oh, yeah. And I didn't, and I didn't realize Kobe was a backup point guard. Did you? Well, he's, you know, a, he's he a, a combo guard. guard. Yeah, he's a com- he's combo guard. So, uh, coming out, that's what he was labeled as, which means he can play either guard spot. Uh, he just doesn't look like a point guard. He's a big, muscular kid that he's plays tough seven, defense. Uh, I think he's more like six four. Is he six what four? I understand. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, Josiah well, is. Yeah, you're right. Josiah is more like six seven. You're right because I remember now. I remember. See, Hugs had him playing. Hugs had Kobe playing the three a lot, which I thought yes. was odd. Because why would you put a six four guy to three? Because uh, he's such a good wing defender. I think that's yeah. why. Okay. Makes sense. You know, but um, it's not the, it wouldn't be the first time a guy was told to play one spot on defense and play a different spot on offense. Mm, and I right. think that's something he could do. I think he certainly guard the best wing defender on a team or the second best and, and play the, one of the first two guard spots on offense. And we mentioned earlier, you know, one of the concerns is perimeter defense. Kobe, Kobe can help with that because he is known as a good defender. You know, yeah. last year he didn't score the ball a lot, but he did well on the defensive side. He usually graded out well on the defensive end of the court. Uh, not so much on the offensive end of the court. So if he can, if he can yeah. get his offensive game to, to match or get closer to his defensive game, he could really he could see a lot of minutes. And let's not forget he he played a lot of last year banged up too. A lot of fans may not yeah. realize that. And heck, I didn't either until the season was over. And I think Hugs right. mentioned it in like a postseason press conference or something. But but yeah, he 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 was banged up a lot last year. So if he's healthy. And can and can start making shots on a more consistent basis. He could, he could see a lot of minutes. Great point. Great and point. Uh, as far as Josiah Harris, he talked about Josiah being basically he's kind of like he said Josiah's their glue guy. He can he can basically play multiple positions. He said he's not great at anything, but he's good at everything, right? Yeah. Um, which is you know, I take that as a compliment. It probably tells you he's not going to be a starter, but he, but he will. Not he will get team. minutes. Right, but he will get minutes. And uh, what's more impressive about Josiah Harris is he's already graduated and he's going into a sophomore year of college. <laughs> yeah. That is baffling yeah. to me. Yeah, he's in the 1% on that. <laughs> yeah, and they asked they asked Tyler about that too because a, a lot of fans were kind of questioning that. Well, it's not possible. Well, it is possible, number one. And Tyler talked about how Josiah just loaded up and took as many classes as he could take. because Right, and he probably had stuff from high school too. Because it's free. He said, "Why not take as many classes as you can take while it's being paid for?" Yeah. So, right. Hey, a lot, a lot of, a lot of young men and, and young ladies don't have the wherewithal to, to think that way. So, hats off to him for doing that. And like Paul said, you can take college classes in high school. I mean, I, my daughter right now, I've got a daughter who's a senior. She's she's taking college classes as we speak already to try to get a head start. So, um, yep. she's a lot smarter than her daddy was. So she's she's got to get ahead <laughs> of the game. But yeah. no, but so it, it can happen. And I've known kids to take. I've I've known kids who graduated high school with already a semester of college behind them because they took so many of those college courses. Now my daughter, I think, right. is only taking one, maybe two. I've known kids to take four or five. You know, 
So it right. can't happen. And if he did that, plus, you know, took 18 to 21 hours a semester, plus summer, plus summer classes, it's very, very feasible to do it. Um, but anyway, so he's basically going to be looked at to be a glue guy. And that's yep. pretty much his expectations for this team. But what I want to touch on next, Paul, is the comments made by <laughs> – we talked about Allard's transparency earlier. Tony Caridi asked him point blank. I, Tony said, my opinion is we've gotten better at, at the center position at the five, basically. Yeah. The guys that we lost versus the guys we've added. And I think Allard pretty much agreed with him. What did you did you take that out of that conversation or not? Well, I think if I if I'll say this too though, if I had it to do over, I bet he wishes Jimmy Bell didn't transfer. You know, uh, based on how everybody left afterwards, I think Jimmy Bell would have a spot on this year's roster for sure. He'd be the third big, maybe maybe the fourth. But I mean, we could use him this year for 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 definitely for depth because he's great. He was a good rebounder and defensive player. I mean, don't forget that Jimmy was not a bad. You just, you, like Josh said, you couldn't throw it into him and ask him to score it close. He said, I know, I coached him, you know, and, yeah. and and which also lets you know, remember, guys, he had a big game against TCU against a guy in Lampkin that was supposed to be way better than him, and who was his coach? Who developed him? Josh Eilert. Remember that. Who developed Oscar Sheebway? Josh Eilert. So our bigs are going to get better. Don't forget that. But um, Derek Culver, go on and on and on. Our bigs have always been pretty good, right? So, but yeah, uh, even Devin Williams. I mean, just keep going and going. I'm sure you know he probably had a uh, had a hand in that. But to answer your question, I definitely think we got better at the big spots. I mean, it was said in jest, really. Anyways, I think coming from Tony, it's a pretty obvious answer <laughs> that we've gotten better at the big spots. Now, I, that's not saying I wouldn't like to have, especially. Mo back. I really want to see what he's going to look like in Alabama this year. I think a Conquo is going to be a career backup. That's just my opinion. I think he, you know, I don't know that he'll get much better on offense, but he's a great defender. Um, at North Carolina, I just don't see him being a featured guy. I'd be shocked. But, but, but I do think uh, Mo has a chance to be extremely. <laughs> he's probably going to blow up and be all world there this year. That's my biggest not fear, but. Just don't. I wish you know, what could have been, but I mean, at the end of the day, I'll take the two we got, the three we got over the three we lost. I, I really would all as a whole. Yeah. And uh, they talked about too. They told a story about how I think everybody on Mountaineer Nation saw the clip about or clip where Josh Eilert was visiting Jesse Edwards uh, in his home country when he was playing basketball over there during the off season during the summer. Yeah. Uh, very impressive. But he, he went yeah. in and talked about how he wanted to spend time with each individual player and their families. And I was really impressed by that, man. Um, he wanted to re-recruit these guys and get to know them a little bit, you know? Yeah. And uh, what, what were your thoughts about that whole that whole part of the conversation, man? Well, it just goes to show the dedication. I think, you know, Josh learned a lot about Hugs. Remember, Hugs was also known to do things like that with players. Uh, I think he – who was it that he met at the airport? I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but basically whenever there were certain players that were known or somebody that Hugs wanted or was on the verge of losing, he was also known to be do things like that. And I think Josh learned from Coach Hugs, you know, and hopefully he takes all the good qualities that Coach had, Hugs had and leaves behind some of the bad ones. But one thing he obviously learned from Coach Hugs was transparency, which is something I, I really love about everything. and. I mean, he, he, you know, I mean, obviously he was on three guys and that's a, you know, it, we'd be lying if we didn't say that those guys are all basically employees at the university outside of Hoppy. Uh, I don't know what Brad does, but I mean, he has been affiliated with the university in the past and obviously mm -hmm. Tony works for him. So they kind of had, a, I would say, uh, an upper hand on a show like us. If we were interviewing Eilert, we probably wouldn't right. have heard as much from him. So we really got a front row seat on, to a lot of good info. Mm -hmm. uh, just really overall, just really extremely impressed with the links he was able to go to to re-recruit some of those guys. and Because it was up in the air with, you know, at some point. I mean, a few of them, 
you and I were told in confidence by somebody, few of them were offered more to leave. So, and we really trust that source. So, um, a few of them stayed for a little bit less money, you know, because of the vision mm-hmm. Josh Eilert has. And I think that's important. Yeah. And I think if, I think once you guys go back and watch this podcast with three guys, if you, if you don't love Josh Eilert even more, I'll be honest with you. Here's my my opinion on. I, I made a comment that in a previous show we did that I and, and you know I you know I did a show on this topic, the whole topic about you know kind of what Gordon Gee has said about Josh Allard and what he's going to do at the end of the season and how we think that you know it kind of kind he's kind of leaning towards hiring somebody different. It, it appears based on his comments. My personal opinion: if Josh Allard even makes the NCAA tournament, he should keep the job. That's my opinion. I, I've I've totally I changed agree. my thoughts on that because I I was in the camp previously that we 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 may not need any Huggins leftovers here because you know we need to, we need to kind of start off fresh. But after getting to know Josh out a little better, hearing his interviews, hearing his vision, he's not Bob Huggins. He's made it clear. No. Yes, yes, I've adopted a lot of Huggins' philosophies, but I didn't I also didn't agree with everything. Be stupid did. not to. <laughs> and I want to put my spin on this thing, especially on the offensive yeah. side of the ball. Right. And he wants to do things his way. Yeah. And to me, after after the off season West Virginia has had, for them to even make the NCAA tournament would be pretty remarkable. Now, I, obviously, I think they have the talent to do more than that. But to me, an NCAA tournament appearance is enough to keep Josh Eilert, Paul. Do you, do you agree with that, or do you think I'm being a little bit too too generous? No, no, I agree. I agree with you. Um, I mean, look, I think, you know, Ren has to do his due diligence as well. If there's a can't miss process, listen, I love Josh Allen, you know, and I think we're all prisoners of the moment in certain moments. And, and, you know, and and to see in this interview, recency bias can come into play, you know, with anything. So I think at the end of the year, a fair evaluation needs to be done. If we made the tournament, I think that, that he stands to really gain. Uh, this job, but but also Ren needs to see who's available and, and possibly keep that in his back pocket because yeah you know name a guy uh, Brad Underwood comes available or I don't know somebody like that you know maybe not Brad Underwood but a guy that I, I is see. extremely high, yeah. you know uh, there are yeah. certain guys that you just can't pass on if they're available and you got to at least make the phone call yep and if you've got a guy at the end of his contract. 10 months, who do you take? Josh Allard after he's gone to the tournament or name a guy that we couldn't miss on, you know? Um, you know, it just it, it insert high level guy and that, you know, compare contrast, you know? Yeah, that's a good, that's a fair point. And it may, maybe I'm, maybe that, and I think I'm probably following victim to recency bias a little bit here, but I just, I really like we what he stands do. for. He talked about the young staff. You know, that's a conversation they had, which I was really intrigued by. I mean, you've got guys who have played that's another at the highest level. And these guys, you know, we, you and I were talking off air about how, you know, offensive coordinators or quarterback coaches can go out and demonstrate to these guys how to do it. Um, yeah. Jordan McCabe can demonstrate how to play point guard in today's game. Uh you know, DeMar Johnson can demonstrate how to be a six nine guard. And I mean he made it to the NBA after one year of college. I mean well, he's, he's going down kid. the list. Deshaun Butler, I mean, can demonstrate how to play at the college level. He he's he's not that far removed from it. You know what I mean? Just go on and you know, Alex Ruoff, go on and on and on. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of complaints about him hiring such a young staff. But Alert love he said he loves the fact that they're young, they're energetic. They're hard workers. They can relate to the players better. Uh, I'm well, actually, Eilert's actually, young himself. <laughs> exactly. You know? So I actually kind of like the idea. You know, he, he's kind of went a and, and you know, and they brought in a veteran guy in J. I think it's James Dickey. I know his last name's yeah. Dickey. Uh, to be the the kind of the assistant to the head coach or whatever his label is. He's a veteran guy, right? He's an older guy. So they have got a mix. You know. So they still have that veteran presence in the room to say, have you thought about doing it this way or this way, or have you thought about this? So I love the mixture of guys. I love the mixture of coaches, uh, different backgrounds, you know, different levels. you got the guys who played the NBA, guys who played overseas, guys who played at, uh, you know, various levels at the college level, all this stuff, right? And uh, 
you got guys like Jordan McCabe who can teach these guys how to how to build a brand off the court. Don't 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 right. That's important in today's game. Yeah, well, he's got a huge social media following. Correct. Look at his the girl, the lady he just got engaged to. Go look at her following. You got several hundred thousand followers. Yeah. So I mean, there's things about it goes deeper than just on the court in today's game, right? And, and I think really this hot. stat. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. And this staff he's this staff he's put together can teach these guys stuff beyond just basketball, and I think that's critical in today's world. Um, Agreed. Well, Paul, I don't really have anything else to talk about. No. Any, any any last comments you want to touch on before we uh, sign off? Looking forward to Saturday. Let's go Mountaineers, guys. We'll be, uh, don't forget to subscribe to Hoops from the Hills. Don't forget to subscribe to Coots' Corner. Uh, little old Mountaineers, Paul talks football. Don't forget about him either. Uh, we certainly appreciate all your support as always. He's on the rise, sorry. baby. <laughs> we're, well, we're sorry about you know, not putting more content out on this channel. It's been kind of tough lately. So we'll try to do better. Yeah, I'm sure they understand. But, yeah, it's – uh, we're always looking for basketball on Twitter. Tag us in it. Tag yep. us something because we're always looking for content for this channel because we want to keep this channel growing. You guys have you guys have brought us this far, and we want to keep it growing. Um, we, we love our new logo. Um, we're excited about that. We're excited about the future of this channel. But, yeah, subscribe to our football channels as well. This is a get-right game coming up for the Mountaineers on the football side. But we're only 50 days away from the start of college basketball season as well when West Virginia takes on George Mason. So we're excited about that as well and, and what Josh Otter and his staff has, has put together. Watching this video, appreciate you listening if you're listening. All that being said, thanks for tuning in. This video is over. We're out. and Let's go Mountaineers. <laughs>